Well, good morning, everybody. And it is just uh, morning here in uh, sunny Gala Shields. Um, first of all, before I forget, um, tomorrow, tomorrow evening, my time, 10 o'clock, my time, four o'clock central time. Um, going to catch up again with uh, Millbilly um, and hopefully we'll carry on. Well, maybe recap over some of our conversation and carry on um, with some more questions for Mill Billy. Um, so that's, as I say, that'll be four o'clock tomorrow, central time, 10 o'clock UK time. Um, so, um, as I mentioned yesterday, um, Tracy Keogh from Freedom and Justice, for Brendan Darcy, our great Australian friend from uh, Melbourne, um, sent me the email in which Kratz um, stresses the need for Fremgen and Edelstein to uh, to do the uh, plea deal. Um, but then she said, you know, you want to look at this um, first few pages, 20 odd pages of this motion hearing, where we get to see Steve Drizzen and uh, Ken Kratz on the witness stand being um, interrogated, <laughs> questioned by uh, Steve Drizzen. Um, and I must admit, there is an absolute gem. Well, there's a couple of absolute gems in this one, but one in particular at the end that, uh, that I'm sure everybody will, uh, will enjoy and scoff at. Anyway, let's have a look at it. Um, hi there, Alice. Hi there, um, I don't recall. Um, let's do this. Hopefully that will work. And let's do that. Yeah, so far so good. Yep, good. That's what we want to see. And... Uh, hide that click on that so this is the um well as it says state of wisconsin circuit court manitowoc county branch three state of wisconsin plaintiff a motion hearing day one state of wisconsin versus brendan ray dassey oh and now what i did do was i set it up on this so that i can scroll up and down a lot better so this is january the 15th 2010 before uh, the most dishonorable jerome fox um and appearing uh well <laughs> awful names kenneth kratz tom fallon but then we get drizzen dvorak um no rider of course um tepfer an attorney another one garrity Hess, Crossley, and Brendan in person. And this is all being reported by Jennifer Howe, official court reporter. So let's jump straight in. Um, so we're going to look at this, this bit here. The direct examination by Steve Drizzen. Uh, let's jump on past the, all these exhibits. leads us to Jerome Fox telling us that this is State of Wisconsin versus Brendan Dassey. It's case number, it's also Court of Appeals number. Appearances, starting with the prosecution. Fallon, <laughs> morning, Your Honour. May it please the court. State appears by special prosecutors, Tom Fallon from the Attorney General's office and Ken Kratz from the Calumet County District Attorney's office. This must be just before he had to resign, wasn't it, you know? Yeah, January 2010. It wasn't until later on in 2010 that Calumet finally got rid of Kratz. And, Drizzen, good morning, Your Honour. If, if it, is it okay if I introduce my team? Fox, let's go ahead. Uh, so Steve says, okay, for the record, on behalf of 
Brendan Dassey, I'm Steve Drizzen. To my left is Laura Nyrider. Sitting at council table, assisting with the technology today is Alex Hess. He is a third year law student at Northwestern University of School of Law. In the first row is Mr. Jo Joshua Tepfer. He is a law professor at North Northwestern Law School. Sitting next to Mr. Tepfer is Miss Ada Crossley. She is a third year law student at Northwestern University. To her right is Mr. Tom Geraghty. He is a law professor and a director of the Bloom Legal Clinic, clinic at Northwestern Law School. And behind me is Robert Dvorak, who is co-counsel with me on this case. So Fox carries on. All right, thank you. I'm going to give a short introduction to the hearing here today. This is a case in which the defendant, Brendan Dassey, which was charged on March the 3rd, 2006. And before I forget, the record will also reflect that Mr. Dassey is here personally was charged on May the 3rd, March the 3rd, 2006, with being a party to the crimes of first-degree intentional homicide, first-degree sexual assault and mutilating a corpse. Isn't it great how, again, Fox hasn't got a clue what date any of this is. The victim in all three charges was Teresa Holbach, who was murdered on August, on October, so he, at least he's got the right month here, the 30th, 2005. Ah, oh dear. Mr. Dassey, excuse me, was tried in Manitrop County by a jury chosen in Dane County. The jury returned guilty verdicts to all three charges on April the 27th or April 25th, 2007. On August 2nd, 2007, this court sentenced Mr. Dassey on the intentional homicide conviction to life in prison with the possibility of release to extended supervision on November the 1st, 2048. Additional concurrent sentences were given for the other two convictions. The defendant, through his counsel, filed on August 25th, 2009, a motion under Section 80930 of the Wisconsin Statutes seeking post-conviction relief. Specifically, Mr. Dassey is seeking a new trial. He alleges he is entitled to this because his trial counsel and his counsel, who represented him immediately before trial counsel was appointed, were ineffective in their representation of him. He also requests a new trial in the interest of justice because he alleges that the real controversy was not fully tried and his conviction represented a miscarriage of justice. To prove ineffective assistance of counsel, a defendant must show deficient performance and prejudice resulting from that deficient performance. A hearing is required, and that is what we will be starting here today. In Wisconsin, this hearing is also is often called a Machna hearing, either Machna or Machna, probably Machna hearing, because part of its origin lies in a case entitled State of Wisconsin versus Machner. I'll go with Machner. Now, Mr. Drizzen, have I correctly summarized what relief your client is seeking? That there's nothing else that you have in your motion. Steve replies, I believe so. We are, we are seeking two forms of relief. A new motion to suppress Brendan's statements and a new trial. Um, and the only other thing I will say is, is that we believe there are two standards operating in this case to judge the ineffectiveness of Mr. Kaczynski's conduct. And those include the Strickland standard, which you articulated, the prejudice standard, and a different standard that governs uh, conduct by an attorney when they are in a, a conflict of interest and there's a breach of a duty of loyalty, which we've labeled, labeled the adverse effect standard. All right, are you prepared to proceed? Drizzin replies, we are. There's one preliminary motion, but we're prepared. Tom Fallon then pipes up, and just so the record is clear, 
we take issue as to whether or not there is a bifurcated standard here and whether it applies in this particular context. Not the, exist not the existence of it, but whether it applies here. Uh, Fox replies, I understand, go ahead, motion. So Steve starts off, I'd, I'd have Mr. Dvorak argue this initial motion, judge. Uh, to which Fox replies, well, before we do that, maybe we should, and maybe I should have done this before, but who's going to be doing what here today? Uh, Drizzen, uh, we're going to be examining separate witnesses. Depends on whether or not the witnesses who we subpoenaed show up. Mr. Kaczynski was subpoenaed to be here today. He has, to the best of my knowledge, not appeared yet. And that witness is going to be examined by Mr. Dvorak. I'm going to be examining um, Mr. Kratz. <laughs> and Mr. Garrett is going to be examining <laughs> uh, Tom Fassbender, Tom Fassbender and we get Burton and Ernie, if we get that far. So, uh, Fox replies, all right, uh, Mr. Dvorak, your motion. Uh, to which, um, obviously, Bob Dvorak says, Judge, it was just a motion, I think, that was brought earlier to exclude witnesses. Um, and there was, in my understanding, some argument by the state that uh, somehow they, their view of themselves as being in a rebuttal posture. Um, and I guess I'm not sure that I understand what the argument is. But we're asking that there be the standard order to exclude witnesses and that they not be allowed to discuss their testimony. To which Fox replied, that's fine. I think this, what Mr. Dvorak is alluding to was a conference that was held in chambers, I think, on the afternoon of the 12th, Tuesday of this week, in which we discussed this. The court said that it would sequester or separate witnesses. Um, Mr. Kratz suggested that since his case was a rebuttal case, although the witnesses that we were talking about were Wiegert and Fassbender, both of whom I understand are going to be called by the defence in any case, is that uh, so we'll have them sequestered. Uh, to which Tom Fallon replies, I, I do have one request for one exemption under that order. It would be investigator Skorlinski. Um, who assisted us in conducting some of the interviews in preparation for the, these proceedings. Um, he's not available today because he's still in another trial in Marinette County, so he will not be available until next week in any event. So we would ask for an, an exemption under 90615 for him to assist us in presenting um, information in this case, particularly for the purposes of conducting cross-examination. Uh, any objection to that, Steve? No, not at all, Judge. Judge, all right, Drizzin. And we have one request for an exception, um, and it's only because her testimony is going to be very narrow and really not focus very much on the issues in this case, and that's that Brenda's mother be allowed to remain in the room during the course of this hearing. Uh, to which Fox says, fine. Although Fallon replies with, um, I would object to her presence during the testimony of only two witnesses. And that would be, guess what? Bert and Ernie, absent that, she can stay for the rest of the hearing. Um, all right. And Steve says, I don't have a problem with that. So carrying on with that qualification, we'll do it that way. All right. Now, are we set? Um, Drizzen, yeah, we are set, Judge. As our fir first witness, the defence calls Kenneth Kratz. Kenneth Kratz, called as a witness, hearing having been first duly sworn, was examined and testified as follows. Uh, state a name and spell your name, last name for the record, K. Ratz. Um, and Steve carries on. Judge, just a quick question. Um, would you prefer that I stand up to address the witness? Does it matter? 
the microphone he the microphone's here so uh to which fox says and that matters not to me okay thank you judge says steve so here we go um question mr kratz uh, may i call you ken or mr kratz or district attorney kratz how would you like to to which kratz replies i answer to everything i bet you do <laughs> Yes, uh, I can think of a, of a few very, very good terms to describe you, Ken. And I'm sure you answer to them all. Uh, but Ken is fine, Mr. Drizzle. OK, thank you. How long have you been the district attorney of Calumet County? Yet yeah, since 1992. And remember, there's huge speculation about his previous job when he was in his previous job that he um, he was up to no good and obviously this confirms it okay and how long have you been a prosecutor since 1985 so i think we can safely see that since 1985 he has been the pervert that uh, that we all know him to be anyway okay during the course of your career have you ever been a criminal defense lawyer no of course interesting isn't it that um by the time making a murderer came out, he was a defense lawyer. Not a very good one, of course. Okay, next. Okay, carrying on with Steve. And in the course of your career as a prosecutor, it's fair to say that you've been involved in a fairly high number of high profile cases. Yes. Okay, would you agree that the Stephen Avery and the Brendan Dassey case, if I can refer to them together, was the highest profile homicide case? you had ever been involved in as a prosecutor to which ken replies i believe it was the most watched homicide case in wisconsin history so i suspect that's true well now we know ken it's been watched making a murderer by millions of people throughout the world and we can all see what the terrible terrible creature you are okay um now i want to begin with your early involvement in this case why was a special prosecutor needed in the prosecution of Mr. Avery and Mr. Dassey's case? To which the sweaty prize replies, early on in this case, um, even the morning that the victim's vehicle had been discovered, the Manitrock County Sheriff's Department, with the advice of the Manitrock County District Attorney, Mr. Roher, Mark Roher realized that there may be a potential conflict between Manitrock County and specifically Stephen Avery of the Avery family. Mr. Avery had filed a, a civil federal lawsuit, as I understand, um, seeking damages from the county and others. And the investigation of Mr. Avery by that civil defendant in such a potentially high profile manner, in the opinion of the sheriff of Manitrock, and, and at that time, of course, uh, we're talking about um, Kenneth Peterson, aren't we? With uh, Robert Herman as his second in command. And the opinion of the district attorney of Manitrock, of obviously Mark Rojo with the assistance of uh, Mike Griesbach, raised the potential for a conflict of interest. Therefore, even at the investigative, investigative stage of this case, they had sought the assistance of another prosecutor to step in and handle both the assistance that is often provided to law enforcement at a pre-charging stage, as well as being willing to handle any prosecution that may come out of that case. Teresa Holbach was a young woman who happened to live in Calumet County, and so our investigators were all already involved in the search efforts for Teresa. We were generally familiar with her, um, with her whereabouts on the day of October 31st. They had already consulted me. I was assisting actually in the missing persons investigation um, for the preparation of cell phone subpoenas and the like, whereby we were trying to ascertain her whereabouts. And so I also was familiar with this case. It's also my understanding that Mark Roher, in deciding who to ask be special prosecutor in the case, um, preferred somebody with a number of years of trial experience, a number of years of assisting law enforcement in major case investigations. And at least in the surrounding counties at that time, I was probably one of the most experienced of prosecutors available. 
So with that long answer, it seemed natural for Mark Rojo to ask me to assist in this case. He called me directly and I proceeded to the Avery Salvage property. I agreed to be named special prosecutor. Question. So it would be fair to say that you were involved in this case from the beginning of the missing persons report. And then your involvement in this case grew even more once Teresa Holbrook's car was discovered on the Avery property. Answer, very much so. Question, okay. Now as a special prosecutor, and this is something I need to understand, your role is simply to assume the role that would have been taken by the Manitrop County prosecutor. Are there any additional duties and responsibilities that you have as a special prosecutor than there would have been for the Manitrop County prosecutor had there not been this conflict of interest? Answer, no. I think that I think that's fair. There are some logistical nuances with working with other counties and getting bills paid and those kind of things that I still may have had to do some things through the Manitrop DA's office. But that notwithstanding, you're very much you're very much you very much step in the shoes of the DA from that home county. OK, now one of your duties as prosecutor of this case special prosecutor was to review the evidence that was being developed and then ultimately decide whether or not to file charges in this case against Mr. Avery. Uh, yes, answer yes, that wasn't my first of my first responsibility, but ultimately a charging decision is what you're talking about. Uh, fell squarely on me. Question. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Now, at the time that you made a decision to charge Mr. Avery with the homicide in this case, you did not know exactly what had happened to Teresa Holbach prior to the time that her body had been burned, correct? And of course, this is a bit of the uh, footage that we see, isn't it, of um, Ken Kratz being called to this hearing and being asked this specific question by Steve Drizzen. And he says, I think that's fair. Okay. And at the time that you filed criminal charges against Stephen Avery for the murder of Teresa Holbrook, you did not have sufficient evidence at that point in time to support sexual assault charges against Mr. Avery. Correct? Uh, that, that's true. OK, you knew that something horrible had happened to her, but you didn't know exactly what had happened to her after the time that she went missing and the time that her car was discovered. Right. Obviously, the physical evidence suggested various um, theories that included some um, to which Steve says, but nothing hard. No, nothing hard. Answer. No. OK. And so would it, be, would it be. So and so would it be fair to say that you did not get a narrative of Teresa Holbach's final hours, if you will, until Brendan Dassey gave his statement on March 1st? always have issues with that. He didn't give a statement. He simply acquiesced to everything that Bert and Ernie said. But anyway, that was the first individual who was involved in the criminal enterprise to give me a narrative of what had happened. A completely false narrative. Okay. Narrative, you know, can be provided by crime lab personnel. And here's what the physical evidence suggests. And this came first and, but prior to the and time prior, Fox butts in, hang on here, one at a time, finish your answer. So Ken carries on, all right. And so um, I had received um, a narrative in, in that respect from the forensic scientists that were involved. However, from a purely layperson's standpoint, for lack of a better term, a this came first and this came second, and this came third. I hadn't heard that series of events until after the 1st of March. So Steve carries on. Okay, so you had some evidence. You were getting some reports from, you know, various crime lab people, but there were significant gaps in the t narrative that were filled in only when Brendan Duss's statement was presented to you. I think that's fair. Okay, now on or about the 1st of March, did you actually view Brendan Das's statements to the investigators? Uh, which ones, sir? The ones on March 1st? No. Okay, did you? Did you review the ones in February 
27, 28, prior to March 1st? I don't recall. I would date it. What I can I expand on that? Yes, please. What I what I would normally do, and because I was involved on, you know, I've got to say a daily basis for the first several months of this case. Investigators, the co-invest, co-leading investigators, we get and Fastbender would meet with me, would provi pro provide me with really daily updates as to the development of the case would ask for my opinion, and not only legal, but strategic on what should happen next, where the investigators should should go next. And of course, we hear that from uh, Pete Bates, don't we, who says that, you know, the person to blame for all of this is Kratz. He basically undertook the investigation himself and got the, uh, the two Muppets, um, Bert and Ernie, to go and do his bidding. And it was in that regard that after the interview of Mr. Dassey on the 27th of February, we had a pretty long meeting about that interview of Mr. Dassey, who was at least rep represented to me very much a witness at that time, not a suspect. And that we at the Fastbender um, still believe that after the 27th of February, that Brendan had seen a lot more than he had been willing to disclose. So I can go into why, but... But for right now, that's they believed that he knew a lot more than he was saying. OK, this meeting with your investigators, Bert and Ernie, did it occur before the Two Rivers interview on the 27th or after? After Two Rivers. OK, thank you. And and probably, probably the 28th, Mr. Drizzen, because of the, um, the number of interviews on the 27th and, you know, where physically these took, um, I'm sure this happened the next day sometime. Okay, when was the first time you viewed Brendan Das's statements on March the 1st? Viewed it? Uh, answer, I don't know. Would it have been within a few days after announcing the charges against him? I've got to think it was either on the 2nd or at least I got a preview of portions of it on the 1st. Certainly, I viewed it in its entire, entirety before the third, before um, Mr. Dassey was charged. OK, and you didn't have a t transcript yet of that interview at the time that you filed charges against Mr. No, but I'm Dassey. Quite certain I watched it from start to finish, including, as you know, the last couple of hours, perhaps of virtually nothing happening on the tape. So, but I still watched it all the way through. Prior to you filing charges or the or the or the day after you filed charges? Uh, no, prior to. OK, now, when you saw Mr. Das's statement for the first time, uh, you knew that in your case against Stephen Avery, you couldn't count on being able to show that confession to Mr. Avery's jury. Correct. Um, you couldn't just walk in and press the play button for that statement in Avery's trial. Yeah, you're you're asking that I, I think a lot about a co-defendant's um, statement and how I might strategically um, weave that into Mr. Avery's case. I wouldn't say that it was at the forefront of, of any decision making. Um, if you're asking me if I was familiar with the law of co-defendant statements, the necessity of some kind of immunity, the, necessi the, the necessity of some kind of plea deal, the necessity of thinking 10 steps ahead in this case. Uh, I probably was cogniz cognizant of all of those things. That's what a prosecutor does. But on the third, certainly um, my focus was on uh, choosing charges against Brendan Dassey that were supported not just by his statement, but by the corroborative physical evidence that we had at the time. <laughs> physical, corroborative evidence at the time. But at some point prior to the trial of Mr. Avery, you were thinking about the evidence you had attempted against Mr. Avery and you realized for the reasons you discussed that you could not use that statement without immunity some kind of plea discussions, some kind of other activity on your part. You couldn't just play that tape in the something Stephen Avery. Pre-trial would have to happen to play that tape 
Thank you. Okay, now, did Mr. Das's statement enable you to amend the charges against Stephen Avery? Yes. Okay. And after Mr. Das's statement, how did you amend those charges? Are you talking about Mr. Avery's case now? Yes. Uh, I added charges of sexual assault, uh, kidnapping, I believe, and something else. Okay. There was a sixth charge. And then I, I should know this, but, but I don't know what the sixth charge was. I'm sorry. It's been a long time. I don't expect you to know everything about this. Okay. Prior to Brendan Das's case, or let's say prior to your involvement in Stephen Avery's case, had you ever met Len Kaczynski? Yes. What was your relationship with him? Len was a defense attorney in the Appleton area. A strictly a professional relationship, Len and I have never seen each other socially. Um, unlike some other attorneys in town that I do have closer personal relationships with. I did not have that kind of relationship with Mr. Kaczynski, so it was purely profession, professional, and I, I, think, um, I think always prosecutor, defense attorney. We, some, some defense lawyers will do guardian ad litem work or other work that I will do, and we're aligned in interest on a case. But Mr. Kaczynski and I were professionally, at least, always in a adversarial, always in an adversarial posture. Okay, um, just a brief geography lesson. Appleton is in Calumet County. And so the south side of the city is in App of Appleton is in Calumet. Okay, Apple Appleton, Appleton's in three different counties. Okay, so had you ever tried any cases with Mr. Kaczynski? I believe I have. Those cases, did they go to trial actually? Not sure. Okay. Have you entered ever entered plea agreements prior to the Avery case and the Dassey case with Mr. Kaczynski? Most certainly. Would it be fair to say that many more of the cases you were involved in with Mr. Kaczynski resulted in plea deals as opposed to trials? Many more of the cases with every defense attorney ends up in a plea deal. Steve Carazon, I understand that. But with Mr. Kaczynski in particular, that would still be the same answer. Yes. OK, now, Mr. Kaczynski was appointed to represent Brendan Dassey in early March of 2006. Correct. Uh, after. Yes. After Mr. Sigolsky withdrew from the case. OK. And shortly after Mr. Kaczynski began, was appointed to represent Mr. Dassey, he began making public comments to the press um, almost from the minute he was appointed to this case. Would you agree with that? Ken replies, I understand that he answered some questions to the press. I don't know at which um, or what Mr. Kaczynski's role was in offering statements instead of being responsive to questions, but perhaps it doesn't make any difference. Statements were made by Mr. Kaczynski about not only, uh, interestingly, not only the procedural posture of the case one might expect an attorney to, to talk about. Mr. Kaczynski seemed somewhat more willing to discuss either uh, matter, mat matters of trial, st trial strategy or what he believed may happen in the case. A predictive kind of statement. And some of the things that he was discussing had to do with entering pleas on behalf of Brendan Dassey. Yes. OK, in your experience as a prosecutor, your years of experience, was that normal to have a defence attorney that early in the case talking publicly about the possibility of a plea deal for his client? Answer, yes. OK. And in fact, I, I, I should tell you with, his, with some of the statements that he was sharing, and, and it's not totally unique for a defence attorney to want to paint his client in a positive light uh, with the media. Um, but Mr. Kaczynski seemed to um, adopt that role quite, quite vigorously. And I will candidly say that in, in at least one correspondence to Mr. Kaczynski, just out of my professional courtesy to him, I reminded him of his ethical responsibilities as far as contact with the media, what I believed he should and should not be disclosing to the media and sort of a friendly reminder, lawyer to lawyer, about what his future responsibilities might be. So basically, Kratz, 
you want to control everything. I, I've, I've seen that, Cratch. You like to, you like to try and be in control, be the one in charge of everything. But I don't want to sound. I don't have an agenda in doing that. Oh no, Ken, no. Perish the thought anybody would ever think that. I certainly did as well. I wanted it to stop. I hear you, and you know. Just so I'm clear, this is this this one instance where you uh, you know communicated with some of your concerns. This was by email in in about April of April the 14th, I believe. I think that's fair of 2006. So prior to April 14th, you made no attempts to contact Mr. Kaczynski concerning his comments about plea deals on behalf of his client. Okay, I don't know if that's true or not, Steve. I think. What likely would have happened is during our ongoing discussions, unrecorded all type discussions about the case, which happens in virtual ev virtually every criminal prosecution, that topic may have come up. I'm telling you, I don't recall it, nor do I have a record re have a recorded um, representation of that, like that email that you're referring to. Okay. Steve goes on, Judge, just one matter, please. Um, we had an order for a motion to exclude witnesses at the beginning that was granted. Mr. Kaczynski is not here today in the courtroom. I just want to clear, make clear for the record that I'd like you to extend your order. If Mr. Kaczynski is at home watching this on some television screen or it's being streamlined, that he is not to be seeing what's happening in this courtroom in any way shape or form fox all right thank you so steve okay motion is granted carrying on by steve okay now um this is the first time we're going to do this mr kratz so i'd like you to turn to tab number 310 and i will get that for you right now it is in binder number five i believe i think i have it here this looks like the health care bill question it does <laughs> to which the uh, judge required let's keep politics out of this uh crap says except i've read those judge so that's the difference so um tom fallon says which one counsel um to which craps replies 310 steve 310 the witness all right i found it uh, so carrying on. OK, um, on March 7th, 2006, uh, Mr. Kratz or Ken, um, Mr. Kaczynski and Mr. Sigelski appeared together on NBC, local NBC TV, um, and criticised you for the amount of detail that you released to the public in your complaint. Do you recall that interview? No. OK. Would reading a summary of that interview refresh your recollection? Nope. How do you know if you haven't read the summary? Uh, answer, because I'm I'm sure I don't recall Mr. Kaczynski or Mr. Sigelski being critical of the amount of detail that was found in a criminal complaint. That's something that I would have remembered and would be very unusual. But um, I can assure you, as I sit here, that I wasn't aware of the criticism at least from Mr. Kaczynski and from Mr. Sigelski as to the content of the criminal complaint. Okay, this is a multi-page exhibit. If you wouldn't mind turning to the third page of this exhibit, Mr. Kratz, at the bottom it says Len Kaczynski, that's his attorney, and there's a quote attributed, attributed to him. Do you see that? I don't. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of different page numbers, and so if you see at the very bottom of the page, uh, Steve says, may I approach the witness? Uh, sure. It's the third page one, the witness, the third page one. Okay. This is more like that bill than I thought, actually. Steve, had you have you had an opportunity to read the comment contributed to Mr. Kaczynski there? That the, the last comment we have, beginning with, uh, we have a 16-year-old court reporter. One at a time, please. Steve carries on. The one beginning with, we have a 16-year-old. Uh, yes, I see that. Do you recall at the time of March the 7th or shortly thereafter, hearing Mr. Kaczynski speak publicly and saying, we have a 16-year-old who, while morally and legally responsible, 
was heavily influenced by someone that can only be described as something close to evil incarnate. Do you recall that? No. Okay, do you recall comments like that that he was making in this general time frame? No. Okay, had you heard him say publicly that he, his client, was morally and legally responsible, would you have spoken to him about it? Probably not. I think that's uh, at least a uh, legal responsibility, I think, is a an obvious statement of of the law in wisconsin as far as morally um, that might be his opinion but that wouldn't have been the kind of egregious use of his position as advocate for his client that i would have taken the unusual step to contact him about you didn't see this comment as a red flag that perhaps mr kaczynski was not acting in his client's best interests that requires me to comment with my opinion and with my knowledge of Mr. Kaczynski's reputation. If you want me to do that, I will. But I, I Steve, I and Ken, I, I'm not sure that's the that's the question that you really want me to want to ask. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to offer kind of sua sponte my opinion in in these kinds of uh, matters. Is there a way perhaps you could rephrase that question? Steve, yeah, I'll rephrase it, but I, I think it's pretty clear. What I'm asking you is, let me let me ask it this, different question, okay? Did I think he was representing Brendan's interest, says uh, Ken? No, that's not my question. Um, I suspect it's, and the rest bit is unintelligible. Um, Ken, I'm sorry, the court. Let him finish asking the question before you answer. Don't anticipate. Steve, would the fact that Mr. Kaczynski had not yet met Brendan Dassey have influenced your opinion about whether or not this comment, you know, raised a red flag to you about whether he was representing Brendan's best, best interests? To which Tom Fallon pipes up, still calls for speculation, to which Flock says, yes, it does. I'm going to, if that's an objection, Fallon, that's an objection. The court, well, it's sustained. Okay, so Steve, uh, question. Well, at the time that Mr. Kaczynski was making these comments shortly after he was appointed, were you aware of whether or not he met, had he, he had met his client? No. Okay, at the time that Mr. Kaczynski was making these comments on March the 7th, had you approached Mr. Kaczynski in any formal way about striking a plea deal with Brendan Darcy? Ken answers, I, I don't recall. And and the one the one person who is conspicuously absent from this hearing is Mr. Sigelski, the first lawyer. And I have an understanding or a belief that, do you know for a fact whether are you testifying about what you believe or believe what, what your belief is or what you know for a fact? What I know for a fact. Okay. I know for a fact that Mr. Kaczynski waived the right, the prelim, and he got skewered. Um, to which Steve replies, that was Mr. Sigelski. Um to which Ken replies, Mr. Skigelski waived the prelim and got skewered by his brethren in the defence bar because of waiving a prelim in a homicide case. I have the opinion that was absolutely the right thing to do with what he had on his plate and that Mr. Skigelski at that time was of the opinion that somewhere down the road this case was leading to a plea, not to a trial. That was in his client's best interest. And is we haven't heard from Mr. Sigelski. And so all of this, this early plea negotiations and the, how inappropriate it might be, we're apparently not going to hear from Mr. Sigelski having said that. You can call him if you would like. And we might. Okay. Having said that, however, uh, Mr. Um, Kaczynski, taking the same practical approach with what he knew at the time, trying to paint Mr. Dancy in an incredibly difficult set of facts in a positive or neutral light, 
with not only the media but with me was going to be an uphill battle. This appeared to me to be the beginning of that process. So to answer the question, I'm not necessarily sure that's an unusual step for a competent defence attorney to take. Same day he's been appointed counsel? Absolutely. Get on it. Okay. Um, in Can you imagine a situation where a self-respecting defence attorney would discuss publicly a plea deal in a murder case for a client that he believed was innocent? Now, this is typical Ken. I don't know how many self-respecting defence attorneys there are, but the ones that you are theoretically talking about um, don't walk into a representation thinking whether their client is innocent or, or guilty. Okay, can you imagine? In fact, if I can, if I, a self-respecting -respe defence attorney, uh, whether they're innocent or not, would not be inclined in the calculus as to whether would not be included in the calculus as to whether or not he can achieve a positive disposition for his client. Steve, Mr. my point perhaps here is that when Mr. Kaczynski was making those these comments, he was telegraphing to the world that it was his opinion that his client was guilty, correct? Uh, scraps, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what he's... Fallon again pipes up. Still, Specky, I'm going to. Um, Ken carries on telling the world. Fallon object to speculation, trying to ask counsel what he thinks was in Mr. Kaczynski's mind at the time he offered those comments. I can come up with three variations right now, just thinking in the top, off the top of my head. So, uh, Steve, I'll with Fallon. I'm going to Steve. I'll with. For Fanny, Fallon, object, Drizzen, I'll withdraw the question. <laughs> the court, all right. Um, Steve, it would be fair to say, though, Mr. Kratz, that at the time Mr. Kaczynski was making these comments, you did not have any kind of a written plea understanding with Mr. Kaczynski. That's fair. Okay. And any discussions with him about pleas would have been at the very preliminary stages. Absolutely. Do you know whether at the time Mr. Kaczynski was making comments to the press about his client's guilt, whether he had viewed the statements that his clients had clients had made or listened to them um, prior to making those comments? Perhaps I, I don't know. And, and I'm quite sure I wouldn't have had that conversation with him at that early stage, whether or not he had viewed the viewed the videotape. The odd thing, this is this is the best thing. This is absolutely classic. I get a load of this, everybody. The odd thing, or what I like to say is, is the positive thing about my office, the Calumet DA's office, is we provide discovery, which means all the materials that we have to the defence without a formal request, without them asking for it, and as early in the process as we can. What an absolute load of rubbish, Ken. <laughs> uh, you know, providing a CD of the, um, of the the computer that you labelled as Brendan Das's years, years later. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Let's just read that again. I, I I had to read that a couple of times because I, it's 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 laughable, but it's but it's really it's it's not laughable. It, it's 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 really really bad, isn't it? The odd thing, or what I like to say is, is the positive thing about my office, the Calumet DA's office, is we provide discovery, which means all the materials that we have to the defence without a formal request, without even, without them having to ask for it, without them asking for it, and as early in the process as we can. And so I do that for the practical benefit of the potential for timely plea, plea discussions or dispositions. And so I don't even know whether Mr. Kaczynski had the DV at that time. You don't know if they had been transcribed yet either, right? Quite sure had not. Right. And this is March 7th we're talking about. So um, had Mr. Kaczynski ever made a formal discovery motion at that point in time? I don't know. But I just told you that he wouldn't have had to. 
Okay, on March 17th, Mr. Kaczynski appeared on the Nancy Grace show. Do you recall that convert that television appearance? I do not. He's probably annoyed that he didn't get the invite. Okay. Did you know that Mr. Kaczynski was beginning to speak not only to the local press, but also the national press about his client? I don't think so. Would that have raised any red flags to you if he was telegraphing to a bigger audience his belief that his client was guilty? Again, Fallon, I'm going to object. He's he's again asking for the for the opinion of another lawyer on the competence or the strategy or the ideas or the techniques uh, of the one who was suspected or accused of being ineffective. And that is, um, first of all, it's an improper use of an opinion. It calls for speculation. And more importantly, that type of testimony is, is impermissible in Wisconsin. Asking one lawyer to comment on the techniques or strategies of another in a MACNA hearing. And if the court wants case law on that, I'll be happy to provide it. Steve, may I respond, please? Judge Fox, go ahead. Steve, Mr. Kack, <laughs> Kack, Mr. Kratz has testified that based on Mr. Kaczynski's comments, his public comments, he felt the need to send him a letter or an email saying, you know, you are, you are um, violating or approaching violating ethical rules in the model code of ethical rules. So he himself began to get concerned about Mr. Kaczynski's comments. I feel I'm entitled to ask him whether the fact that Mr. Kaczynski was going national raised any red flags in that regard in March, not in April, when we're going to get to that discussion. The court, I'm going to sustain the objection. Uh, this continual asking of Mr. Kratz's opinion of what Mr. Kaczynski was doing at a particular point in time, it seems to me is, is simply going to lead us to nowhere. Uh, Steve, carries on your honour. It, it, it's, as you know, it is our position that Mr. Kaczynski breached his duty of loyalty to Brendan Darcy. It is also our position that Mr. Kratz may have been aware of these breaches and may have in fact facilitated some of these breaches and clearly benefited from some of those breaches. I think it's important that I'll be able to interview Mr. Kratz or question Mr. Kratz about what he was aware of with regard to these breaches and how they affected his actions at the time. So, Judge Fox, the ruling stands, the objection is sustained, move on bit terse. Steve, okay. Um, how long after you were appointed, uh, Mr. Kaczynski was appointed to this case, do you remember having serious plea discussions with Mr. Kaczynski with regard to his client? Perhaps I remember having plea discussions with Mr. Kaczynski prior to the May 4th suppression hearing. Okay. Um, I don't think I can pinpoint a date but the May 4th hearing becomes an important pivotal date in our plea nego discussions because we both recognised, Mr Kaczynski and I recognised that until we received a ruling from the court, there could not be any serious plea discussions other than just some kind of general ideas about where this case was going until both attorneys knew whether the March 4th statement was going to withstand the motion to suppress and so that's what i'm saying is and so what i'm saying is even though we discussed plea negotiations we had jointly agreed that after we received the ruling on the may 4th suppression motion that any plea offers any plea discussions or efforts by mr kaczynski to perhaps paint his client in a positive light which i'm sure we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, was going to wait until after the suppression ruling Okay, um, if you will, Mr. Kratz, I would like you to take a look at Exhibit 343, binder number five. And if, if you'd like, feel free to review it because it, it's an email and it may refresh your recollection. I've reviewed it and I'm now familiar with its contents. Okay, do you recall sending this email to Mr. Kaczynski? Vaguely. Well, when, when, when I read it, uh, clearly it's authored by me and it sounds like stuff I say to defence attorneys. So, yes, I, I recognise it in that regard. Okay, thank you. 
Now, at the very end of that email, the second page of that email on exhibit, on exhibit, exhibit 343, it says page two at the top. The top, um, there are, there is, there are a couple paragraphs that talk about plea potential. Correct. There are. Okay. And uh, in these, does this in any way, um, in this, cons is this consistent with the testimony that you gave about serious discussions about pleas would have to wait until after the 5-4 hearing? Right. This is what I would consider the opening salvo, if you will, as far, that's the, as uh, words I was going to use, the opening salvo, as far as our plea discussions. So this is March 24th, correct? Yes. So it'd be fair to say that prior to March 24th, 2006, you had not made a serious invitation to Len to enter a plea on behalf of his client. Right. And in fact, the end of this uh, memo, uh, memo uh, makes it clear that any discussions about plea potential will occur after the May 4 motions. Okay. You invite him in this memo to talk to you, to talk to you prior to the May 4th motion, correct? Yes. Okay. Was there any discussions with Mr. Kaczynski prior to the May 4 motion about entering a plea on behalf of his client? Uh, Len, I, uh, Ken, I don't recall. Steve Carazon, was it your understanding at the time you made this opening salvo that Brendan Dassey was insisting that he was innocent in this case? No. Was it your understanding from Mr. Kaczynski that Brendan Dassey was claiming responsibility for some of the actions in March 1st? I mean, some of the actions in connection with the death and disappearance of Theresa Holbach. Answer, I didn't know if I asked Mr. Dassey. I relied upon Mr. I know you didn't talk to Mr. Dassey. Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Kaczynski, I was re relying upon Mr. Dassey's own statements. Right. On the first. And let's be fair. Uh, Mr. Dassey was engaging in a number of conversations with his family in which he described various topics, but things like whether Brendan should engage in a plea discussion. But more importantly, whether Brendan should testify uh, against Uncle Steve or discussions frequently had with Brendan's most immediate and with his extended family. But you knew that he had recanted his confession or his statement on March 1st, that his position was that, it, that was that that statement was not true. You know, as of the 24th of March, I'm not sure I did know that. Okay, I'd like you to look at page one, if you would, of this document. Just go back a page. And focus on the bottom paragraph, if you will. Yes, in this bottom paragraph, you... How would you characterize what you said to Mr. Kaczynski in this bottom paragraph? I don't want to do it for you. Uh, this requires that I step back uh, just very slightly, just, just this one step as to the state of the investigation at this time. The investigation had, although been thorough, uh, was far from being complete. When you look at a serious crime scene, um, it's important from a law enforcement perspective, and this wasn't news to me, but you look at what's there and you look at what's not there. You look at what's missing, right? And in this case, there was one item of what we believed was significant physical evidence that had not been recovered, and that was Stephen Avery's digital camera. We knew Stephen Avery had a digital camera, we knew he had it at his home. We knew from his girlfriend, Jody that he had taken digital photographs. And we suspected, as you think about a case like this, that a digital camera of Mr. Avery might yield some important evidence. Up to this point, we were not able to ever find the digital camera. And so my suggestion to Mr. Kaczynski is there are some items of physical evidence that are still missing, that haven't been discovered. One of those, and I even identify the digital camera, that digital photos may exist and suggested that in a discussion with his client, that is exactly the kind of information that the state would find helpful. Okie dokie. Um, 
I think we'll hold it there. Um, clearly, yesterday we were talking about the um, the plea deal. Um, it's I, I, I think um, I think most of us are pretty much of the opinion that these plea deals are a bit of a disaster. Um, they just lead to far too many people being being wrongly convicted. Um, I must admit, I did laugh at that paragraph about the fact that uh, Calumet doesn't even wait for people to ask for evidence. He just automatically sends off the stuff as soon as possible. Uh, what a load of baloney. Anyway, um, I better crack on. Um, let's see who, all who's here. Let's start from the bottom and go up. Um, so, hi, T1. I uh, hope you're enjoying having that blue spanner. <laughs> Dr. Sutman, hi there, Sean. Uh, Joyce, Joyce Keith. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, Linda's here. Hi there. Hi, Linda. Um, I'd say that the usual suspects are all here. Hi there. Well, thank you all for, for joining in. I must admit, it was quite interesting to... Uh, oh, Petra, hi there. Quite interesting. Uh, I haven't really. I don't think we get much chance to see Steve Drizzen in action, do we? You know, um, interesting to see uh, to see that. I thought the uh, comment by Ken about the fact that you know, in theory, if there if there are any sort of decent defence lawyers, I thought that was that was most uh, uh, most sort of uh, uncalled for and way way below the belt. Um, Anyway, apologies if you've read that that section already, but as I say, it was Tracy Keel that suggested have a look at it. Um, um, yeah, I, I I think it's pretty obvious that you know Len Kaczynski went in with there with the the job primarily of uh, securing a, a plea deal. Um, why else would you get Michael O'Kelly to do all that he did? Um, but I find it I find it strange to conceive that um, Kratz, Fassbender, Wiegert, uh, O'Kelly and um, Kaczynski weren't all working together. I find that very hard to, uh, to, to imagine. I might be wrong, but, but as I say, I, I, don't, I don't see that as being the case at all. Um, anyway, as I say, thank you all for, for joining um, and uh, we'll catch you all again soon. Um, this evening, uh, music chat is with a very good friend of mine a young fella from Dumbarton called William Scott who goes by the name of Woolly so I'm uh, going to have a chat with him about all things Scottish Cordian wise and continental etc um, and then hopefully um, to make up for the fact that the audio wasn't wasn't terribly good on um, was it Monday night yeah Monday night yeah Monday night um, with Mill Billy, we're going to have another get together and um, discuss a bit more of uh, his excellent work. Anyway, um, I'll say cheerio. We will catch you all very soon. Um, take care. Bye for now. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye for now.